What NFC East running back has seen the most fluctuation in his value this past week? What AFC North tight end might be a bust masquerading as a sleeper? And what do you do with the suddenly deep stable of the Carolina Panthers running backs? We've got a great show for you. Farrell Elliott is here. I am Eric Balkman, your slightly <laughs> above average host that is trying to uh, to get something special out right now. And I don't know if it's going to happen, but we're going to do our best right now. And here you we go. Your High Stakes Fantasy Football Hour starts now. I can't stay on the pressure. I've seen greater men than me. Broadcast live and heard around the world, you are now watching the most entertaining hour of radio on the planet. Welcome to the High Stakes Fantasy Football Hour presented by MyFFPC.com with your hosts Eric Balkman and Farrell Elliott. The High Stakes Fantasy Football Hour is your home for analysis from the best players in the world. And now, because no one else was available, here are Eric Baltman and Farrell Elliott. Silence in the scripture, are we not all our father's sons? I became a man, nobody ever told me what a man was. Thank you so much, Rob, and greetings and salutations to all the Balkholics and Ferelliacs tuning in to the latest episode of the High Stakes Fantasy Football Hour presented by MyFFPC.com. I am indeed your slightly above average host, Eric Balkman. My co-host is the definitive commissioner of fantasy football, the one, the only, the incomparable Farrell Elliott. Farrell, you are the glue, man, holding it together tonight. Uh, thank you so much. I apologize for the delay for all of our live viewers, but we're off. We're ready to go, and you are the star of the show tonight because we're going to talk a lot of never-too-early best ball stuff with you. Oh, that's exciting. I'm on my fifth team. I'm wondering if I might not be too far in. Well, now here's the interesting thing. Um, so we're not only we're going to discuss that, but there's an under the radar wide receiver signing that I think is important that could be very fruitful for high stakes players. We're going to get to that. We're going to talk about a late round quarterback that's looking like a real nice buy as well. And we actually have breaking news uh, coming in tonight regarding Chris Godwin, Raheem Mostert. We'll see how much we can get uh, to that as well. Now, if you want to connect with us on Twitter, we are at the HSFF hour, or excuse me, at HSFF hour. I am at Eric Balkman. Farrell is at J. Farrell Elliott. The Kentucky Fantasy Football State Championship is at KFFSC. Also, KFFSC.com. That's where you can check it, uh, check him out uh, there. HighStakesFantasyFootball at gmail.com is the email address if you want to get a hold of us. And then we'll try to get to all the chat room questions from the live viewers, all the tweets, all the emails, and the fantasy feedback segment later on in the show. I want to thank uh, our uh, audio engineer and my best friend, Bryce, and, of course, our producer and mutual friend, Rob. A couple of things right off at the top of the show, ladies and gentlemen. Um, the um, oh, that's the wrong show rundown. Got too many shows going on right now, Farrell. Way too many shows going on right you now. You know, Balky, when <laughs> when Dave Letterman got in this, he would just sometimes he'd wipe his brow and go, and Paul would play a little something, and everybody would get back on track. You know, and you just need to slow down, pretend yeah. band over here, and just just. Take it from there. You'll be all, all right. Hudson uh, Kern Reeve chiming in in the in the chat. He says, "My camera's not on, right? I don't want it, anybody to see an Ivy League professor sitting in his pajamas watching this." Kern, nobody can see you right now. It's all good. Uh, enjoy the show. Uh, also, enjoy dozens of Dynasty Orphans available at myffpc.com slash dynasty for sale. You can register for the Never Too Early Best Ball Tournament that's going on right now. Compete against Farrell Elliott and that. Win a million bucks in the 2022 FFPC main event. And, of course, plenty of slow, live, sit-and-go best ball options all at myffpc.com. The Run to Daylight Championship is open for registration. And of course, all the draft masters at kffsc.com as well. Um, all right, so we'll get to the first breaking news, and this isn't really breaking anymore because it happened this afternoon, but the Washington Commanders actually signed J.D. McKissick to a two-year, $7 million contract. Now, what's interesting about this is earlier this week, um, there was a report that McKissick um, signed with the Buffalo Bills. McKissick actually never signed that contract. Adam Schefter uh, said that Washington initially chose not to give him an offer at all, um, but then the, they decided to match the deal that Buffalo offered him once they saw the terms. Um, this was interesting because you had, oh, first of all, real quick, um, 123, uh, 986, and four touchdowns through two years in Washington. Um, the, the big issue with this is a lot of people for about 24 hours were very, very excited about their Antonio Gibson shares. Now not so much 
anymore. But Farrell, maybe that's an overreaction because, you know, McKissick was pretty involved last year and Gibson had some really nice games. Uh, as we go to the Mojo and thank Darren Armani from FantasyMojo.com uh, for putting this together, I just want to remind everybody that Antonio Gibson, running back 12 at the end of the second round, to me, still not a bad buy, even with McKissick back in the fold, Farrell. All right. I, I don't think it affects him one way or the other. There's going to be running back help and pass game supplementary player um, in the uh, commander offense, but Gibson is still the man. No matter who is there, he's the king of that backfield. Um, our media is going to have to get used to an agreement in principle that uh, can't be signed until the new year, uh, league year starts, which is tonight, um, shortly after we end the show, Balky, at midnight. Uh, apparently what happened here is that the commanders looked at the deal from Buffalo, saw the terms, said we can live with that and we don't want to lose this player. And, you know, the player tested the market and the team answered the market. And I think it's good for Gibson and all other uh, commander players, especially the new quarterback, uh, to have J.T. McKissick uh, continue wearing 41 and, and continue in our nation's capital. Um, Kern Reeve wants to know in the uh, chat room if O.J. Howard actually is going to wreck Dawson Knox's value. And we found out a couple hours ago that O.J. Howard would be leaving Tampa going up north uh, to join the Buffalo Bills. Um, O.J. Howard had 140 catches for almost 1,500 yards and 12 touchdowns in 36 games. He tore his Achilles um, early in 2020, and then obviously last season, Rob Gronkowski and Cameron Bray were the tight ends du jour there. Um, I think this might actually be a good thing that O.J. Howard comes to Buffalo. Um, it, it, it would probably free up some blocking responsibility for Dawson Knox, and he can maybe go outside and make some plays. O.J. Howard might be that inline guy, um, and, and this could be ultimately good news for Dawson Knox. Farrell, are you seeing it the same way? Good news for all Bills players. Brings in a two-tight end system or a two-tight end set more often onto the field, frees up, Docs, uh, frees up Knox to be the improving player that he is. Howard gets a fresh start. I like this for both players. I'm with you, Balky. Um, and by the way, and, and I'll, I'll give you the mojo on, on Dawson Knox right now, too. Um, he is actually tight end nine at the 805 right now, right after Dalton Schultz, right before Pat Fryer moves. So that's where you'd have to take Dawson Knox. He actually could climb there. Um, but the next guy uh, is, is Dallas Goddard. He's going tight end seven um, at the middle of the sixth round. I don't see uh, Knox creeping up to that territory, but never say never. Um Moving on to a tight end that is maybe not so bueno um, in Austin Hooper, who is now looking for work. Um, nine and a half million do the Cleveland Browns clear off their books uh, for, for uh, cutting Austin Hooper. Originally in spring of 2020, he signed four year, a four-year $42 million deal with Cleveland and then uh, in two years caught um, 84 balls. As a reminder, his final year in Atlanta, he caught 75 balls there alone. Now, um, he had Baker Mayfield throwing to him. We know the situation going on with Baker Mayfield and, and the Cleveland mm -hmm. Browns right now. Farrell, who's the beneficiary of this? Is it is it Harrison Bryant, or is it the guy that they actually just franchise tagged did Cleveland in David Njoku? Who's the winner here uh, as far as the uh, Hooper release goes? Well, this still determines who's going to be the quarterback, uh, but we're going, to, we're going to operate under the idea that Mayfield is gone. And my goodness, if it's Watson – what a great win for Njoku. Anybody who's drafted him is going to see his stock rise. They'll never get him at the bargain that they got him. Uh, this is a very good ball player. Um, good down. We'll, we'll talk about a rookie ball player uh, at the, coming out this year that kind of reminds me of Njoku. But, you know, what, we've, what we're finding out, and it's just not limited to Baker Mayfield, although he – is is definitely the poster child of the miniature quarterback that can't see past his line, can't deal with the athleticism, the ever-increasing athleticism of the defensive lines that swat the balls down. And we're losing the ability of the tight ends to make catches. Uh, Hooper's uh, lack of production certainly had nothing to do with his skill set, but the offense and what it was limited to uh, being burdened and shackled uh, by Baker Mayfield, a quarterback. This is a new day for Cleveland Brown fans, uh, but it's definitely a new day for the tight ends 
uh, on the field there. And, you know, perhaps uh, someone in the Beckham family can put Hooper together a, a film showing uh, how he had been uh, uh, misused and uh, disabused there in Cleveland, and it will advance his opportunities. Yeah, and um, I don't know. We'll see what happens uh, with, with where he ends up going forward. Certainly we'll discuss it right here on this show when he does sign. Um, speaking of signing, Deontay Foreman signed a new contract. Mm-hmm. It was one year, two million bucks, this time with the Carolina Panthers, according to Ian Rappaport uh, on Twitter. Deontay Foreman, very exciting player when he came into the NFL, tore that Achilles. That was really bad. And quite frankly, I, I wrote him off after that. And I was wrong because he came back and was very, very uh, played very, very well in Derrick Henry's stead last year when, when Henry went down. Um, Foreman uh, gets 566 yards on 133 carries uh, during the closing stretch of the season for Tennessee. And now he joins not only Christian McCaffrey, but Chuba Hubbard as well. So just to kind of unpack this as a whole, Farrell, um, I, I don't, I never got the feeling that the Panthers really wanted to turn the keys uh, to the backfield over to Chuba Hubbard solely when McCaffrey went down. We've also heard McCaffrey's name come up as, as a potential trade candidate. Uh, several times this offseason, and now they go out and, and sign Foreman. I, I think Occam's razor here would dictate that Foreman and Hubbard would be the committee if McCaffrey were to go down again. Um, but other than that, am, am I, should I be reading more into this right now? Anything more than that? Is there something swirling here about a potential McCaffrey move in the future? Uh, probably not, but you have to have depth at the running back position, and it's available, and it's, you know, you know, the finances that are being paid to some of the positions around the league. And then you look at running back and you see that the running back after making a nice contribution does not get a whole lot of respect financially. That's a lot of, it's a lot of running backs, uh, even those with experience and a good resume that are bunched together and the general managers kind of have their pick. And so you've got this contract and an opportunity. Foreman's career was bulky. You were hundred percent right. Um, it was stuck in reverse and stuck in the mud and his opportunity uh, with the injuries at uh, Tennessee to get uh, back in business with the people from Houston, from the coaching staff that knew him was his key to, to regaining his place in the league. Good for him. He'll be a good contributory, uh, a contributing uh, Carolina Panther, but no more than that. And only fantasy relative if there is a mat- uh, trade or if McCaffrey once again, is bitten by the injury bug. Um, zero RB target is is Foreman. I mean, if you if you were gonna go zero RB or or maybe you, um, well, let let's do it both sides of the coin. Number one, if if Foreman is now a part of this backfield, does McCaffrey no longer have a handcuff if you draft McCaffrey, Farrell? Um, that's exactly you, right. That's okay. exactly right. So you, not, so maybe, not a true handcuff. maybe you get one of them late, but you're not targeting mm-hmm. either one. Okay. No. All right. So now if you go zero RB and Hubbard and Foreman are both out there, when you want to take a running back, who is the preferred target for you? Is it Foreman or is it Hubbard? I think for me, it's Foreman. I think it would be Foreman as well, but you know, we get a preseason to sit with this and see what the expectations right. are, but you know, <laughs> there is no handcuff to McCaffrey because there's no players like McCaffrey. Yeah. So, you know, it's a guy that's going to play, but it's not going to play like McCaffrey. Um, this is the one that I think was really interesting. This next topic, uh, Ian Rappaport reporting that a three year, $30 million contract was offered and signed from the Buccaneers to Russell Gage. So mm-hmm. Russell Gage ends up, uh, his last two years of the Falcons, uh, gets almost 140 catches, almost 1,600 yards and eight touchdowns. Um, now he goes to Tampa. Now, th- here's the other breaking news. We found out that Chris Godwin just signed a three-year, $60 million deal with Tampa. Uh, but he also tore his ACL in December. I don't know when, when he is going to be back, but it's certainly, I'd be shocked if it was right away. That said... Russell Gage, to me, always been an unsexy pick throughout his career, always been overshadowed by either Julio Jones, Calvin Ridley, Kyle Pitts, or all of them, right? And now he goes to Tampa where he could be the the, the number two um, receiving option there, at least to start the season, behind Mike Evans. He has gone – now this is – the mojo I have probably has not been updated since he signed with Tampa – but the earliest he's gone over the last week is the 11.06 fantastic buy. 
Farrell, I don't know if I mean I, I see him ascending uh, multiple rounds here. When would be a good round after how many receivers are off the board? Would you be be uh, feeling good taking Russell Gage? I think I'd probably take him in the top forty, maybe even in the top thirty right now. Yeah, I think he's a seventh, eighth round receiver, even with the Godwin signing, and and everyone should expect that. This was a player, we were Balky, when you and I started on the show. When I joined you, it's a player that we talked about very, very early on, and I have never seen what I wanted to see out of him. And that was true for uh, the the end of that season. But ever since, I've seen an improving ball player. He has worked through all the problems that Atlanta has has, has had, and he's the one player that's benefited where I thought he was going to have a very good year in Atlanta. He'll have a better career now in Tampa. Um, good for good for he and his agent, and good for the Tampa Bay Bucks seeing what kind of ball player this is. His best play is in front of him, and now it's in the company of these Tampa Bay Bucks with Tom Brady uh, back at quarterback. This is a wonderful situation for this player, and yeah, everyone should look to get this player on some of their rosters. Russell Gage finally desirable by high stakes ah, drafters after how go. many years? Um, speaking of desirable uh, players, Farrell, let's talk about some of the players that you've been getting in the uh, Never Too Early okay. FFPC Best Ball Tournament. And we'll kick things off in the Dallas backfield. Mm -hmm. A lot of Tony Pollard on your squads. Yes. No Ezekiel Elliott. Uh -huh. So, Mike, Mike, and, and certainly you have to, there's a lot more draft capital that goes into drafting Elliott. Yes. But what are the chances that this is the year? People, I know high stakes players have been clamoring for more Pollard for the last two years. And this will be year three of free Tony Pollard. What are the chances that he actually outscores Elliott this year? Uh, probably not. Um, Ezekiel is a wonderful selection. I got him. I got him today in the fourth. Oh, year. nice. Very, very, very happy to get him. But, you know, people talk about how he's finished, how he's didn't contribute. His best days are over. Thousand yards last year, Balky. Ten touchdowns. He caught forty-seven balls. That's pretty good contribution, yeah. as far as I can see. And he's going to continue. This team is comfortable in handing handing him the ball. And uh, you know, if he was working with an injury last year, which which I think he was, uh, perhaps he can break through with that, get that in his in his past, and have even a better year. But this this uh, offense is significant enough to support two running backs. Pollard's. Uh, Pollard's play and usage has increased every year. He didn't do much with scoring the ball last year, but, you know, he had got 130 carries. If that runs up to 150 or 160, he got 40 catches. If that runs up to 50, it's worthy of a seventh-round draft pick. That's what I've been paying for him. Uh, probably in uh, outside of the best ball format, I would take him a little later. But with the explosiveness, uh, the electricity that he has, um, the upside, I think that you're dealing with a player that is perfect for the, for the best ball contest. And if, if Ezekiel does uh, falter next year, it will likely be towards the end of the year. And if Pollard gets more play, it would likely be when that happens. And at the end of the year in this contest is when you really want your team to step forward. So I think he's an important player. Uh, in, in the best ball slims. Tony Pollard in the never too early best ball running back 34 at the 801 right now, as far as uh, his ADP, Ezekiel Elliott 407. So right smack dab in the, in the fourth round running back 18. That's right before Josh Jacobs, right. Uh, I beg your pardon, right after Josh Jacobs, right before Eli Mitchell, which we'll get to in a little bit here. Um, Cam Akers, how big of a mistake are drafters making mm -hmm if they take him at the 308 Farrell um, and, and not necessarily on, on the same squad, but how big of a mistake is it also to not grab Daryl Henderson at the 12, 12, a lot of disparity between acres and, and Henderson uh, as far as ADP draft capital goes right now. I'm not going to call acres as a mistake, but if you ask me which player I like drafted evenly or, or set evenly, I, I always select Daryl Henderson. And now I can get Henderson. Balky, you're telling me that the mojo and Darren says get him in the 11th round. I've been getting him late everywhere. I can't believe that he's available. It's, I have always uh, saw something very, very special in this player. Um, I think back to our days when we were drafting uh, Etienne and, and Robinson. 
Yeah. And, you know, we were drafting them back to back because no one would decide. You really couldn't determine. But you know that that running back position, even if it's split 50-50, is a very valuable position to have in fantasy football. Which player do you like the best, Bob? Between those two, um, I like – I mean, I saw what Akers did last year, and I know there's a lot of people. There was a lot of people doing victory laps on, mm -hmm. on Twitter when he came back last year, and quite frankly, I didn't think he'd look as good as he did. No, and he's a Florida State guy too, so it's hard for me to say it's it's Henderson. Um, for me, um, if I am picking in the early third, and I am looking at, I mean, my choices be cam Akers, aaron jones david montgomery those oh, yeah. that's that's what i would be looking at there mm -hmm. mike boy it's tough because you know I, I think the guy the running back i like best at that spot in the third round it might be and i i know it's it's not a popular offense but it might be montgomery um yeah you you have a situation where you know henderson is going to get worked into the uh rotation uh in in los angeles Aaron Jones and A.J. Dillon, I mean, A.J. Dillon had, I believe, more carries than Aaron Jones did last mm -hmm. year, so he's getting worked in. What's the competition for David Montgomery? Yeah. You know, certainly there's there's the draft and everything, but Montgomery looks uh, looks the part right there. Um, Henderson in the 11th, Henderson in the 12th, if I'm going zero RB, even if I'm not, you know, when I'm going for those injury away running backs, um, that's a great pick for there. So we I, need I, to push – we really need to push that player uh, yeah. up the board. And, and uh, look, he's got what – He's, he's got what every running back would love to have. He's got long speed. He's the guy that once he breaks through the uh, defenders, uh, he he hits in a different gear. And yeah. it, it, when you talk about acres down the stretch, uh, 67 carries in the playoffs for 162 yards. Sure, it was against top flight competition. Uh, Henderson catches the passes. No, it makes absolutely no sense for Henderson to go in 11 if acres is going to third. Yeah. I like all those guys better than Acres, but uh, no, th this is out of sorts. And as long as it continues out of sorts, everyone should draft Daryl Henderson. I know I'll be doing it. Yeah, I mean, I look at some of the guys going in front. I mean, like James Robinson is going in front of him right now. James Robinson, who's, co who's coming off the torn Achilles. I, I don't know what what people are doing here. I'd much rather have Henderson. Um, yeah, I, I, he's going. He is going right. I mean, this Gaskin's going to drop now with the signing of of Chase Edmonds and Raheem Mostert, obviously. Um, but, I mean, I'd rather have Henderson than him, Mike Davis, Gus Edwards. I mean, all these guys. Alexander Madison's interesting. He's going right next to Madison. Madison. That'd be an interesting one um, because of the, uh, of, of you know, the Dalvin Cook uh, handcuff aspect. But I think it's still Henderson for me there. Um, mm. Moving on to more running backs. I teased it earlier. Eli Mitchell. Is he mm. the correct answer? When you, when you talk about all the – the, the draft capital that you have to invest in order to get a San Francisco running back of which Raheem Mostert isn't one anymore. <laughs> um, Eli Mitchell, is he the answer here? Uh, because I look at, you know, hasty as whatever sermon mm -hmm. was, couldn't get off the pine last year mm -hmm. and now Mostert's on the other coast. So I think this, all these Eli Mitchell shares that you already had, you got to be thrilled with them right now. They want to give Eli Mitchell the ball there in a run centric offense. You know, there were six games last year, Balky, that he had over 20 carries. There were two times that he flirted with 30 carries. In those games, the team was 5-1. and one. Around week 10, they played the Rams. That's when he carried the ball 27 times. They won that game 31-10. to 10. When, the, when the 49ers are winning, this guy is the key to it. It, it. We've all seen what he can do, how electric he is, how explosive he is. He's a much different kind of runner than Henderson. He's very, very similar to Mostert in the aspect that once he's in the, the open field, he's got great contact balance. He's got great acceleration. It's a rookie player that's still learning how to play the game out of Louisiana. Uh I absolutely love him. I think he's a bargain at the sixth round. Again, but I don't want to pick, keep uh, picking on Cam Akers, but you listed a number of guys going in that fourth and fifth round uh, or in the fourth round, and there's no reason to draft Mitchell um, that high, but I think Mitchell's a better player than all of them. Um, Hudson Reba in the chat right now, he wants to know uh, Chase Edmonds versus Raheem Mostert, uh, the top, the, what we think is going to be the top two running backs in Miami. Normally, I'd say, oh, it's Edmonds for sure because yeah. of his pass catching acumen. But then I think, well, Mostert did play for Mike McDaniel last year. Mm -hmm. McDaniel, now the head coach of Miami, he brings Mostert in. 
maybe there's something there. I still lean towards the pass catcher here in this case, but maybe it's not as strong as I normally would. You know, and it, these 49ers have uh, these coaches and, and front office personnel that leave there. They have a great affection for their former running backs. Tevin Coleman uh, went to the Jets last year, didn't get a lot of opportunity to do some things, but well, guess what? He signed another contract this week. He'll be back there this year. Yep. Uh, I'm, Mostert is an exciting player to have in the league, and I think that's what has been missing uh, down. They've tried to build – uh, that entire ship around that quarterback doing an RPO most of the time. If you're going to have this kind of uh, this kind of offense, you've got to have some options to run. Now they have it. Uh, it's still to be determined who they'll use. But yes, mo- both those players are so affordable. I think that they're good players to be in business with, and uh, both of them will contribute. And that, that's why our uh, that's why our best ball slim. That the FFPC is is such a popular format and such a great great uh, tournament. You don't have to decide when you're going to start these players. You just have to decide when you're going to draft them because they're eventually going to co- contribute. Yeah, and and that's the great thing is you know they will at some point, and you know, hopefully it's one of those big weeks at the end when when you really need them. Um, let's shift to receivers here, and I I believe we violated um, uh, HSFFO our contract um, our contracted duties several times here the last few weeks we haven't brought up chase claypool anymore and now (laughs) it seems like we we kind of know who the quarterback is going to be in pittsburgh (laughs) it's yeah it's it's looking like it's going to be mitchell trubisky Uh and i i gotta be honest with you i have never seen you know trubisky used to get just fried all the time on twitter when when he was um with the bears and then obviously didn't hear much about him last year because he was a backup I've never seen him praised more since he was back in college. Um, everybody's talking about like the, the, this Trubisky signing is uh-huh. is one of those things in Pittsburgh. It's like, well, it doesn't look good on paper, but watch for the results on the field. And I think there's a lot of people that believe that Trubisky is going to make – he's going to keep Johnson relevant, Deontay Johnson relevant, and he's going to make Chase Claypool relevant again. I'm, I'm going to make the hat, the red hat, make Chase Claypool relevant again. And that'll be what Trubisky's wearing this year. Do you see it the same way? Is, is Claypool in for a bounce back now with oh, Trubisky? Oh, we can have a complete show on this. Yes. Um, what Trubisky is successful at, and yeah, first of all, we, we let's just talk a little bit about Trubisky. Uh, you know, he was the second player drafted when he came out. Was it 2017, Balky? Uh, that sounds right. I'm going to look it up 17 right was his year. He was the second player overall drafted. So everyone – in, in the football industry would like a little validation because, because there were a lot of people that believed in Trubisky. He had a hard time getting things going in this league, but when he did, if you go back to 2018, this is a Pro Bowl player for the Chicago Bears, threw 24 touchdowns versus 12 interceptions, had three guys on the team, over 50 uh, catches. And you think of one that came and to be recognized as a top receiver, that was Allen Robinson. He and Allen Robinson in that year had some good things going. And the kind of balls that Robinson got, that's the kind of balls that we're going to see Claypool get. Claypool is a, a tremendous competitor in the vertical passing game and utilizing uh, the sidelines uh, and having a quarterback that can drop that ball in and having him win the contested ball. If he gets the separation, he'll look like Mike Williams. If he gets the contested ball, he, well, in some ways he may still look like Mike Williams, but he'll look like the physicality that we saw from Claypool in the first year. Um, this is a very, very big opportunity for Claypool. Um, it, it, it's in, in regards to the quarterback, Trubisky's in the perfect place now. Uh, it, it's interesting that Dayball, the offensive coordinator, leaves and becomes the head coach of the New York Giants. He probably would have wanted to take this player with him. But he ran into the Daniel Jones thing, and I think even the coach had to say, you know, if, if Pittsburgh wants you, that's probably where you need to go. So it, it's a great situation for him. Yeah, yeah, it really is. And, and if he's going to bounce back, he's – He's not going to, I mean, he goes to a, a really good franchise, uh, a, a team that has always had a really good offense, has maybe not the greatest offensive line, mm-hmm. but a very strong running back and really capable receivers uh, and, and a young tight end that he can count on too. 
um, in in between the uh, in between the hash marks. So I, yeah. I think there's there's a lot going for for Trubisky this year. One, By the way, one, one Chase thing Claypool about at Trubisky. the nine oh two right now. Go ahead, Phil. Well, and one thing about Trubisky, um, he's very successful in play action. Uh, some people might take that further and call it the RPO offense, but they'll they'll move him around a little bit as a play action quarterback. Think of the guys that are successful in that way: Jameis Winston, uh, Tannehill, Prescott. Uh, all of these guys would likely be successful if they were the Pittsburgh Steelers quarterback, and Trubisky can be too. Um, the uh, switching coasts here. Robert Woods coming back off the torn ACL in, in 2022. Cooper Cup coming off one of, if not the greatest receiver season uh, overall of all time. Yet Van Jefferson, the, the guy who had to hustle out of, of uh, SoFi to, to witness the birth of his kid at, at the Super Bowl, um, you get him in not one but multiple spots here. Uh, and I'm just kind of wondering, do you view him as a spike player? Is this a guy that that is going to um, come in with, with some solid weeks if – until Woods gets back or in case Woods or Cup were, were to go down. How do you view Van Jefferson, and, and why did you want to get him on, on multiple teams? No, I view him as a contributor from day one. 50 catches last year, but to go with that bulky, 800 yards, uh, six TDs on a team that knows how to get in a red zone. Now, yes, he's dealing with a lot of tools. But what are all the defensive coordinators in this league trying to do right now? How do we stop Cooper Cup? What do we do? Do we do we drop the safeties? Do we roll the coverage? So much attention is going to go to Cooper Cup that other receivers are going to benefit. The tight ends are going to benefit. This guy is a steady Eddie. I think he takes those 50 catches from last year and moves them up to 65 to 70. There's nothing overwhelming about that. But if you take a look at what he did in the playoffs, uh, there were 23 targets, I believe, in, in the play. No, check that. 17 targets during the playoffs, nine catches. He was still a steady and consistent player through the playoffs, despite the fact that you had Beckham there as well. So we're in a situation that I think Jefferson is an ascending player, continues to get better. I don't know what I paid for him. Probably early I paid a little more than I should, and probably late I might have got more bargain than I should. But either way, I'm happy to have this player on the team. And he will be a consistent contributor, uh, but it, it drafted uh, drafted to be the fourth receiver, uh, you could do a lot worse. Yeah, no, and that, and that's again. And now, if 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 Beckham does come back, I mean, are are you just kind of wiping out um, what Beckham's regular season contribution would be for Los Angeles because of that? torn ACL in February. Is is that something that's that's not too much of a concern in drafting Van Jefferson right now? It doesn't concern me. I, I do hope Beckham does come back. I, what is it slated for? October, November, something like that? I mean, everybody heals differently, but yeah, yeah. November is, is, is in the cards, I guess. And, and chances are it could be earlier than that. Uh, when he comes back, he adds a different element to the passing game. We have to see where it is exactly, but he does <laughs> Again, it's a situation where uh, Jefferson, you look at it, there were 17 games last year. He started 17 games. Uh, he was on the field for 80% of the snaps with all that talent on the field. You know, I, I know that uh, I know that we lost the beloved Bobby Trees, but the, uh, the situation is that I think this player will get on the field no matter who's there. And when uh, Beckham does come back, it, it puts a lot of uh, – it, it takes up a lot of responsibility in the passing game away from those tight ends and adds to protection of the quarterback, which is very important in that division that they play in. Let's um, stay in Los Angeles, but we'll, we'll flip conferences. My Josh Palmer dream is over. Uh, I thought I'd be him and Keenan Allen this year, and the Chargers let Mike Williams go. Uh, it was never meant to be, apparently, mm -hmm. because he gets the big contract from the Chargers – and so he he gets the money, right? Mm -hmm. He's 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 got that to fall back on. He's got a at least one massive season to fall back on. He's had some couple a couple other decent ones as well. Six oh one as far as his ADP goes. Now that we know that he's going to be catching passes from Justin Herbert in not only a very good offense, but for a team that's probably going to be in several shootouts, given how talented the offenses are in that division. Mm -hmm. Um, how much higher than six oh one? 
uh, do you think Mike Williams is going to ascend to? Is he going to get up to the fourth round? And and if he does, is, is he a price worth paying there? That third round reversal in Kentucky gets me confused. Dave. I drafted him at 501, I think, in the first one. You know, it, it – look. He is the most complete wide receiver that you could possibly draw up. And he's, he's got this breakaway speed. He's got a quick first step. He's got these giant hands. He makes all the contested catches. When he first broke into the league, um, he had five contested touchdown catches, mainly because – Philip Rivers would never let go of the ball. Do you remember when we watched Rivers playing for the, the Colts? It got worse over time. <laughs> we say, throw the ball, throw the ball. And, and you know, Rivers had that slow release, and so all the all the passes were contested. That has gone – that play and what Williams had to do with Rivers has actually helped elevate him to the player he is now. Speed and physicality, good size, toughness, Playing in a division that now has Russell Wilson, where everybody's going to put points on the board, um, it's a team that doesn't seem to have a a dominant tight end aspect to its receiving game, and an offense coordinator now that didn't do that even when they were in New Orleans. Uh, yeah, you can't overdraft Mike Williams anywhere, but especially, especially in this format. For best ball, Mike Williams is just – it's just a gift any round you get him in. Um, all right. Question from Hudson Kern-Reeve here. He wants to know who the – and I we know he's a Cowboys fan, so I don't know if he yeah. was just wanting to feel better about what my it's answer would be to this. Um, Farrell, best quarterback in the NFC East. Wow. Dak Prescott in Dallas, Daniel Jones in New York, Jalen Hurts in Philly, or um, Carson Wentz in Washington. Dak Prescott for me, it's not not close. Hudson is is Prescott still with the Cowboys? Because if he see is, that would be your quarterback. I, <laughs> there should be a follow up question. The real question should be a follow up coming to us. Uh, well, well, here here's the thing. Like, I I think you could you could make an argument, and it's not a strong one. A losing that, one, yes. that, that losing one, yeah. That Jalen Hurts, uh, because of his legs, would would be the best fantasy quarterback. I can't make it with a straight face. I'm not going to try to make it with a straight face. Um, I'm very excited to see what Dallas does this year again uh, with Prescott and and obviously Gallup coming off the injury and and C.D. Lamb. This should be a big C.D. Lamb year. Um, and then the tight ends too. Um, now you have uh, Dalton Schultz and a couple of these never too early teams. Blake Jarwin is not a cowboy anymore. Um, and and I I think that this and by the way, Noah Amari Cooper in yeah. Dallas anymore because he's going to be in Cleveland. Dalton Schultz is climbing, climbing, climbing up up the ADP right now. And, and I think if you got in early and drafted him early, you got to be feeling pretty good about yourself. He is now a – we touched on it earlier – 802 tight end eight, Farrell. Tight mm -hmm. end eight at the 802. To me, that is a – it's weird because it, after the top seven guys are gone at tight end, you have Kelsey Andrews, Pitts, obviously Waller, Kittle, and then you have – um uh, Hawkinson and Goddard. It's mm -hmm. it's actually Hawkinson in the fourth, and then you have this big drop off to the mid six where Goddard goes, and then you have another drop off to the eighth, and then that's where Schultz goes, and you see Dawson Knox and Pat Fryermuth go, uh, so on and so forth. Tight end eight at the eight oh two. What's Dalton Schultz's ceiling? How high amongst the tight ends could he finish this year? Is tight end five too crazy? I drafted Schultz in front of Goddard, and I have to keep myself from drafting Schultz as high as the sixth round. Now Schultz needs that offense working on all cylinders to be successful. He's a very good player from what you would expect a receiving tight end to be. He runs a 475, but he's consistent in getting off the line. He has very good hands. He'll make it, he'll make the catch in traffic. He won't he won't win the contested catches against a very fast and aggressive safety, but once he gets his hands on the ball, he will hang, hang on to it. He's a excellent player and he's a player that the tight uh, the quarterback um, has no vision issues in that offense the quarterback looks for him sees him and lets it fly and that's how Dalton Schultz and and, and Prescott have become such a great combination and, and yeah I expect an increase um, in Schultz uh, production but I would have expected it no matter who 
was at uh, the wide receiver position. There's going to be some young guys, I think, from this draft coming into Dallas to play the position as well. Uh, Schultz will probably start strong and finish strong in this offense. Um, okay, so number one, I am not in rookie mode yet, and I probably should be because okay. I know it's mid-March. Yeah. You drafted a tight end here, mm-hmm. um, and and I'm embarrassed to say I don't even know how to if I'm pronouncing this guy's name. Jalen Wittermeyer? Widermeyer. 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 Jalen Widermeyer. There you um, go. You have you've taken him in a few drafts as well. The guy out of uh, Texas A and M, Texas A and M, kind of a pipeline for um, for um, rookie tight or for mm-hmm. tight ends in the NFL. Um, what is it about Widermeyer that, that you like so much? Um, mm-hmm. uh, what 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 about him translates to the NFL right away? His rookie season. Well, first of all, he played in the SEC. You know, I I spoke with uh, I spoke with none other than the great mind. Uh, who shares the fact with you, uh, Balky, that he is he doesn't pay much attention to the rookies until it becomes drafting time, and that is our our great friend uh, Brad Cruz from the Fantasy Assassins. Uh, he and he said something to me. He said, "You know, you can't uh, you can't really count on rookie production at tight end in year one." And you know, to a degree, that's correct. But this player, first of all, reminds me physically of Friar Moon. Uh, mm-hmm. In in height and size, but not in body composition. Friar Muth is a is a is a chiseled, um, a typical uh, inline tight end with catching skills. Uh, Widermeyer is a different sort of player in that he's angular. He's got real tall, high hips. He's the kind of guy that uh, could take a little bit to get going uh, because of the way he's built. But once he gets going, he's on the move. He covers ground efficiently and effectively. He's got great hands. He's A lot of people are going to look at him, and he's going to remind them more of a slot receiver, even though he's 260 pounds. And, you know, it, it, there's something that the old scouts will say about a guy that has high hips. They'll say once he catches the ball or once he gets out in space, there's nothing to grab onto. There's nothing to tackle him. Go to YouTube, Balky. Watch him play. Now, he – a lot of the tight ends at the combine this year, um, they didn't run the 40s. They they did not completely work out, and because of that, uh, there were a couple that that did that uh, have gained the respect. There's another one named Trey McBride, but Trey McBride is a complete tight end, very much like our uh, very much like our guy Kittle out at, with the 49ers. They're going to ask him to do a lot of things. Uh, Weidemeyer, they're not going to ask him to do anything but catch the ball and get in the red zone and catch more balls. And, you know, Texas A&M has a pro day coming up. Uh, These players uh, that have come through these big, big schools, they've got these huge weight rooms, these big facilities, but they really don't develop into the kind of pro they'll be until they get into individualized training, combine training, and really understand what nutrition and daily workouts can do with their body. And hopefully we're going to see that from this player. This player might be a, uh, a poorer man's pits. Uh, and in the right situation, he could catch a lot of balls and, and maybe, uh, Maybe not as many as Pitts did last year, but maybe more touchdowns. So, yeah, I like him. Uh, there's a lot of tight ends that I like, but this is my favorite one. It's weird because he's going in the 17th round right now um, in the in the Navaturally best ball as tight end 32, and he's going right after Gerald Everett, whose days might be numbered in Seattle after the trade of Noah Fan, or to get Noah Fan. Mm-hmm. You have O.J. Howard, who obviously won't be in Tampa. He's going to be in Buffalo. He might move up. We'll see what happens. Then you have Weidermeyer. Then T- Tyler Conklin, who just signed with the Jets, joining C.J. Uzuma there. Mm-hmm. Um, and then uh, Austin Hooper, who's looking for work. So when you're looking for upside that late in the draft, I mean, Weidermeyer looks really good all of a sudden. You mm-hmm. sold me on it, Farrell. Um, I'm, I'm now a Weidermeyer fan, and I could pronounce his name. I don't know there which is go. better. Um, all right. Tom Brady is back. Yeah. How much stock should we be putting into Rob Gronkowski joining him in Tampa when we're drafting um, in the Never Too Early? Which, by the way, as far as Gronk's ADP, it's obviously climbed um, since Brady came back. He is now going as uh, tight end 23 
uh, at the uh, fourteen oh seven. Um, wow, he's so, now going at the fourteen. I was drafting him in the thirteenth. No. Uh, it's a done deal. I I thought that it that he might flirt with the idea of leaving and playing somewhere. Uh, playing somewhere else, but it, it, it's a done deal. He'll be there. Um, I just saw a blurb. I don't know if it was NBC Sports Edge or who had it that Gronkowski was in a barber shop in Tampa, and somebody asked him if he was going to come back, and he said, "Oh, maybe I'll just let Tommy worry a little bit for for a <laughs> while." So, and so I don't know if he's if this is just. He probably already told Brady, but he's publicly hasn't come back. So I don't know what's yeah. going to happen. It's always a lot of talk going on in the barbershop. Yeah, that, you got that right. Um, Davis Mills, you grabbed him mm -hmm. as well. And the Deshaun Watson uh, trade rumors are heating up. Obviously, we've heard Atlanta, New Orleans. Um, I heard a little bit of Seattle, Carolina as well. Mm -hmm. It's certainly – well, let me ask your opinion on this. Um, and maybe your opinion, uh, I should know, because you drafted Davis Mills in a few spots. Um, is Watson getting moved to somewhere and is Mills just the starter this year that and Houston wants to see what he can do? Oh, um, yes. Watson is getting moved somewhere and it, it's going to be difficult for him to make a decision because the people that want him really, really want him. And, you know, he's in a troubled spot in the world. Things are looking up the first time they've looked up for Watson in a long time. Sometimes when uh, things are bad, you, you go home and, and home is Georgia. And you would think that Atlanta, with the kind of ownership that they have and some of the problems they've had, um, this would be the right place for him. But, uh, you know, the Browns are uh, – uh, Mr. Haslam can be quite convincing as well. So mm -hmm. it's, 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 going, it's going to be a better league with Watson in it, and uh, his, his legal situations will work out, and, and they'll work out somewhere with him outside of Houston. Now, Davis Mills. Um, Davis Mills, there were three games last year that he threw over 300 yards. I felt validated because I would talk to this time last year, and I wasn't joining you on a regular basis on the show. Uh, but anyone that would listen to me, I would tell them about how Davis Mills was one of my favorite of, of the rookie quarterbacks coming out last year. And people kind of give you the side eye a little bit. And it, uh, it, it, you know, he had three games where he threw over 300 yards. My favorite Davis Mills, and, it, you know, he's already proven what he could do. If you recall, Balky, they went to Buffalo and were shut out early in the season, 40 to nothing. Davis Mills was replaced in the game after starting, after throwing four interceptions. He came back the next week, New England's coming to town. Everybody talked about how New England was going to tear them apart. New England won the game, but Davis Mills threw for 300 yards in that game, and I think two touchdowns. My point is, while all the other quarterbacks struggle with touchdown to interception ratio, Davis Mills last year is 16 TDs and 10 picks. Uh, he protects the ball. He played well towards the end of the year. 16 of his TDs came, or half of his 16 TDs uh, came in the last four games. Uh, he did very, very well against a uh, truncated and, and, and replacement played Tennessee team after they had already clinched their playoff. But he still went up there and competed and played very, very well in that last game. It, it, look, Davis Mills has answered the bell and he's played well. He's going to get more players. He's got a coach that uh, it, if you look at the uh, some of the coaching staff that was retained there on the offensive side of the ball, they'll all tell you how Davis Mills, uh, they thought he would start someday. They thought he would be an NFL starter, and someday came very quick for him. And it's it, he's quietly gone about building a, a very impressive first-year resume. He's already in the, some of the places – where these other guys are trying to get to. Uh, I love that he has Brandon Cooks there. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the guy performs every single mm -hmm. every single year. Um, and I love that he's got – I like Nico Collins quite I like mm -hmm. Nico Collins quite a bit last year. And the fact that he gets his second year in the NFL um, with seemingly the same quarterback I think is going to be a good thing for him as well. Um, the professor wants to know, who scores more points this year in FFPC, Russell Wilson or Tom Brady? And um, I look at this from the standpoint of the, the divisions, right? Tampa, to me, with Brady is, is still the team to beat. I don't know what's going on with New Orleans. I think Rappaport was a Rappaport or um, some, some 
well-known guy, uh, like a well-respected uh, guy on uh, Twitter said that they might have the inside track uh, to Watson, which would be interesting because that would certainly clear things up in that division between New Orleans and Tampa. Um, Carolina is still kind of finding their way. Um, maybe a coaching change is, is coming this year. Mm-hmm. And obviously Atlanta is just, it's a bad situation there um, as well. Now you flip it over to the a- a- AFC West. I mean, Russell Wilson is going to have to – I mean, I know Denver's got a pretty good defense, adding Gregory and, and so on and so forth, but mm-hmm. he's going to have to put up a lot of points, man, uh, mm-hmm. this year. He could still do it with his legs. Brady, to me, obviously can't. So I think I would put my money on Russell Wilson outscoring Tom Brady this year. Russell Wilson outscoring Tom Brady this year. I would put my money there too, but it's not by much. And if we're playing in best ball, I would probably like to have Russell Wilson. If I've got to pick my quarterback to play week in, week out, probably in this division and for the reasons you just spoke of, Balky, I'm going to choose Tom Brady. So okay. it depends on the kind of format that, that we're in. But, uh, yeah, that uh, we may see some lively football uh, from the AFC West this year. And you'll always – you know, we got a quarterback in Russell Wilson now that's got something to prove. Yeah, he's got, a, he's got a big chip on his shoulder, and a lot of people that believe in him around him, and and you know it's it's going to be fascinating to see uh, what he does with it. Well, and the other thing too is, yeah, he's got a chip on his shoulder, but at the same time, there's some pressure on him too because yeah. if if he does not perform in Denver with all these weapons, um, there there's going to be a lot of conversations of, oh, well, maybe Seattle was right all along. It's the same thing when when um. um it was put up or shut up for Aaron Rodgers when Matt LaFleur got hired too, because he knew that, that man, if I don't, you know, go out there and play my best and, and really crush it, there's going to be a lot of people saying maybe the Packers are wrong. Maybe it was Rodgers was the issue and, and not Mike McCarthy. So I think Russell Wilson has a little bit of that pressure going on as well. He seems to thrive on it though. Uh, so, so I think it's going to be a good season for him and for Brady, quite frankly. Um, let's get to a couple of emails here before we wrap things up tonight. The first one is from Bill in Jacksonville. With the removal of, of Calvin Ridley from the 2022 season, would you guys recommend drafting Kyle Pitts over Mark Andrews now? Thanks so much. That's Bill in Jacksonville. Mark Andrews had a career year last year, Farrell. And I look at this from the standpoint, I did, when whenever you see a career year, I'm like, okay, well, who was missing? What happened? What were the extraneous mm-hmm. circumstances? There weren't really any in, in Baltimore. I mean, yeah, Marquise Brown got off to that great start, and then he just kind of fizzled. But I don't really – and and Bateman was missing um, at the start of the year, but Andrews was crushing it with Bateman late in the year too. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, 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 I love Mark Andrews. I don't, I, quite, I don't frankly know what to expect from Atlanta. You know, they had the opportunity to redo Matt Ryan's cap number. They chose not to, which to me means that he could still be on the move. I know I heard Indianapolis as a potential – destination for him as well i don't know who the quarterback is going to be in atlanta i don't know who else is going to be catching balls in atlanta this year i don't see any reason why if i'm a defensive coordinator why i'm not just going to totally focus on kyle pitts and let everybody else beat me it's mark andrews all day i, I can't draft pitts over andrews no and they got very very physical you saw that with the defensive coordinators in the league they got very very physical with pitts and after a while it frustrated him to a great deal and they could do that uh, because of the problems of the, the type of receivers that you had um, in Atlanta. Now, you know, they're still – we still got to consider them in the Watson chase, and if they get him, that changes the idea about Pitts. But uh, Andrews, uh, to me, is the premier tight end in this league. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see him uh, actually, by the time we get to Las Vegas – to see him to be the first tight end off the board. If he shows up healthy, feeling good, body's good, off the field, health issues, good for him. Uh, he's he's overcome a, a lot of things to get where he is in football, and, and he is the heart and soul of that passing attack, and it's, it's fabulous to watch it. Yeah, it really is. Um, and, and as a Mark Andrews uh, owner in numerous leagues last year, I know I loved it. Mm-hmm. Um, all right. The next email we have here is uh, from Omaha, Nebraska. It's Matt. Uh, should the Kyler Murray drama sway me to drafting Joe Burrow instead, guys? Uh, thank you for the email. Kyler Murray, quarterback five at the 601. He's going right after Justin Herbert. 
Burrow is actually not going until the middle of the seventh round. In fact, Dak Prescott going in front of Joe Burrow there. So to me, I, I, I think Murray's going to play. I think he's going to play well. He loses Kirk. Um, he's going to get Hopkins back. Um, I don't know. A.J. Green is a free agent, right, Farrell? He's, still, he's out there. Yeah. Um, and, and obviously James Conner is there. Uh, they just got Max Williams back as well. So the, maybe the weapons for Kyler Murray pale in comparison to Joe Burrow, but what Murray has been able to do with, with his legs. And I always say that, that, you know, anytime there's, there's a debate between two quarterbacks and they're razor thin in every category, I'm always going to go with the guy who is able to get those 30, 40 uh, rushing yards a week. And, and especially if you can get in the end zone rushing as well. So I'm going to, I mean, I'm not, I guess I'm concerned about the drama, but not enough for me to say, hey, Burrow's a better pick than Kyler Murray here in the at that five six turn. You wait and you pick Joe Burrow is is how you should handle. Yeah, I think yeah. it's very, I, th- I think it's very um, a prescient decision for drafters to look at the player off the field. We talk a lot about winning in the locker room, winning in practice, setting the right example. Uh, I think it's important to look at what's happening to some of the smaller quarterbacks and the defensive coordinators are catching up with them. They're taking away the parts of the field that they can't see. I'm just not picking on Baker Mayfield. There's a lot of these guys that are challenged in stature. If, if you know, the people keep saying, well, Farrell, that quarterback can run. Yes, he can, but give me a big guy that can run. Give me Josh Allen. Carson Wentz can run a little bit. Trubisky's 6'2". He's not a big guy, but he can run some. Yeah. I can keep going and going. Well, I, I think the defensive coordinators in this league have caught up with the run-pass option to a degree. And if you are – if everything's clicking for you – that offense works very well, it, it, and that's what they're counting on down in Miami. That's what they're counting on with Trey Lance out in San Francisco. But if it's not working for you, it leads to quick three and outs, and and we saw a lot of that in Arizona. And uh, yeah, I've I, look. You've got a player, you, you, you know, you you've got a quarterback in Arizona that cannot lead the team. You've got a guy in Cincinnati. That, that, that people can't wait to get to work to play with. So, you know, Joe Burrow, to me, is the choice that uh, is going to win in the NFL. Consequently, he's going to win in fantasy numbers. He's going to do it with those excellent receivers, all three of them, throwing the ball to him. It's going to be great. I think this next email is interesting because my answer has changed on it several times since mm. we've gotten it in. Tim in Camden, New Jersey. What's up, fellas? Leonard Fournette is a free agent. So does that make him less desirable in drafts than Michael Carter? Thank you. That is Tim in Camden, New Jersey. Now, Farrell, when when Tom Brady was retired, yeah, I mean, I was going Michael Carter over Fournette all, all day long. There's there's mm-hmm. no point, you know. Now that Brady's back and they're trying to get at least most of the band back together, and I know Greg Allman, who covers the um the uh the Bucks for um, is it Pewter Report or who does he? Okay. Oh, no, it's The Athletic. He's with The Athletic. Beg your pardon. He's with The Athletic. Mm-hmm. He said he thinks Fournette and Ronald Jones are not going to be back in Tampa. Hmm. With the return of Brady, I think Fournette might be back in Tampa. Mm-hmm. And then at that point, he might be a little bit more desirable than Michael Carter, who just – you mentioned before, Tevin Coleman returning to the Jets, um, kind of gumming up the works there. Um, but Leonard Fournette back in Tampa, I, I I think that's very compelling. I think I might take Fournette over Carter right now. I like winning running backs. I like running backs that play on teams that are going to win some games and they're going to get ahead and they're going to quit passing the ball in the fourth quarter and turn around and give it to the running back. I, I think that's a wonderful formula. And I don't know how many games the Jets are going to win, but I know when they do win, they're likely to win them through the air. And Carter will catch a lot of balls. But Fournette is one of the players – who, when he was released from Jacksonville, uh, landed in Tampa and became another guy. He became the metamorphosis. Lombardi Lenny. Right? Yes, it's 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 a metamorphosis of a player that that found out before it was over that hey, I got it. I understand what's expected of me now, and I'm going to deliver. And he got in the company of, of, of pros, and he played like a pro, and he'll continue to do so. And I think he would be a very attractive. Uh, free agent pickup in the league, and I would continue to draft him um, uh, wherever he plays, uh, especially if it was a a winning franchise. And you see the depressed market 
four running backs. Fournette should be at the higher end of that market. Um, but, yeah, the fact that he will likely end up back at Tampa now makes that, uh, to me, a no-brainer. Running back 22 right behind Brees Hall is Leonard Fournette. He's right ahead of Clyde Edwards-Alaire. Michael Carter not going for, uh, too much farther after that. Uh, running back 27 at the 606, Fournette at the 509. So about a round uh, separating the two uh, between them right now. Let's wrap up with one final email. Oh, and it's a Raiders one, Farrell. So this is the perfect way to end it. Pat in Norfolk, Virginia. Hi, Farrell and Balky. Can the commish put aside his Raiders fandom long enough to tell me if Michael Thomas is going to be better than Hunter Renfro in 2022? Oh. That is Pat in Norfolk, Virginia. So I'm looking at um, the mojo. These guys are actually pretty close. Michael Thomas, wide receiver 22 at the 507. Hunter Renfro, wide receiver 26 at the 511. So, Farrell, if you make up your mind, if you have a late fifth round pick and you're going to go with one of those two guys, um, oh, I know what you would do. What would you tell everybody else to do? Would you just tell everybody else to take Michael Thomas so you can have Hunter Renfro? I just, um, I don't, I don't, this is why you got to put aside your fandom here to answer this question. Well, I, I've got to also put aside my fear of the unknown. And, you know, Balky, I don't live in, I don't live in fear, but I'm not sure who Michael Thomas's quarterback is right now. No, we don't know. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm not sure how Michael Thomas is going to return to the field right now. It's been a while since he's been out there. Um, Hunter Renfro, on the other hand, I think we saw the best season statistically we'll ever see from Hunter Renfro again. Uh, Hunter Renfro will be a fantastic football player. He will be a good uh, fantasy player, but he's not a fifth-round draft pick, uh, I don't think. Uh, I, I think that, uh, you know, the nine touchdowns, I think that number is correct. I don't think we'll see anything like that again. I think he's a 90-catch, six-touchdown guy. And, uh, you, you know, if we get if we get real lucky, we can get that out of Van Jefferson. So I suppose I'm going to go ahead and tell you to draft Michael Thomas. But I think both these players are being overdrafted. Balky, who comes next after these two? Well, I, I'll, I'll tell you, they bookend a lot of um, receivers. Well, I shouldn't say a lot of them. There's three receivers that go in between Thomas and Renfro. Oh. Tyler Lockett, who I, I guess we don't yeah. know who his quarterback's going to be. Elijah Moore, who I know a lot of people are on, very excited about him. And then another guy, and I think we haven't been the only podcast to compare these two. There's a lot of people out there comparing um, – Amon Ross St. Brown and Hunter Renfro uh, because of what they did last season, the type of receivers that they are and, and their roles in, in their offenses. But Lockett, Moore, and Amon Ross St. Brown all going between Thomas and Renfro there. In this group, I would go with Elijah Moore because I think he has the highest ceiling, the highest potential, and is the best player. Yeah, uh, and, and certainly you will – I mean – I, I don't think that that's a bad pick, um, especially in the never too early best ball um, uh, championship, best uh, best ball championship tournament. Um, right at that five oh eight, that makes a lot of sense right there uh, to get Elijah Moore. And you heard it from a Raiders fan to take him over Hunter Renfro. So you know it's got to be true. We don't blow smoke on this show, ladies and gentlemen. That will complete uh, our show uh, this evening. I want to thank uh, Farrell Elliott uh, for uh, hanging out uh, so graciously, putting up with the delays to start the show. You are a saint, sir. Thank you, and thank you again. And we will be back on our Friday schedule yeah. uh, next week. I believe we're going to have uh, Chris Ballard, the uh, $100,000 winner of the no Football way. Guys uh, Playoff Challenge. So he's going to hop on. Uh, fingers crossed. We'll see what happens with that. Um, he's he's uh, He's going to let me know. So hopefully that's what we'll do. Um, if not, we'll have another great guest and we'll have another great conversation with you, Farrell. Buddy, I look forward to seeing you and Mr. Ballard next week. Have a great uh, March Madness. And, hey, by the time we get together next week, maybe Devontae Adams will know a little bit more about what he's thinking about. It'd be good. You know, James Jones on the NFL Network, who's who's pretty plugged in with with all things Aaron Rodgers and, and Devontae Adams and Randall Cobb. He thinks that this deal is actually closer than a lot of people are letting on. So maybe we get something done here soon. I think it's going to be a while, but you never know. Well, we'll figure it out next week, man. Figure it out next week. Thanks, man. Thank you. Farrell Elliott, ladies and gentlemen, the commissioner of the Kentucky Fantasy Football State Championship. Check out all of the games uh, with uh, with Farrell at KFFSC.com. Follow him on Twitter at Elliott. The KFFSC is on Twitter at KFFSC as well. 
Draft Masters opening up there. And of course, uh, the Run to Daylight Championship, which drafts are starting in a little bit less than a month. So make sure you're competing for that. That's going to be a, a fun one again this year. I also want to thank the FFPC, Rob, Bryce, and of course, each and every one of you for watching, uh, for streaming this later. We are back next Friday at 10, 9 Central. As a reminder, as I let you uh, go enjoy the madness here this weekend, uh, dozens of Dynasty Orphans available, myffpc.com slash Dynasty for sale. There's uh, some price as low as a dollar out there, and there's actually some really good teams, so make sure you're checking that out. Great addition, 365 days of fantasy football. Why wouldn't you do that? So check that out. Uh, we mentioned the Never Too Early Best Ball Tournament a bunch of times tonight, so make sure you're taking advantage of that. Um, and uh, taking a shot at $25,000. Those drafts will close up next month. Um, uh, that will be the cutoff by the NFL draft. Then those that tournament will close. Um, plenty of slow, live, and sit-and-go drafts uh, right now. I'll let uh, myffpc.com if you prefer a closed 12-team league. Um, and then, of course, don't forget, you can register to win a million bucks with the FFPC um, uh, main event this year. A million dollars is what we're giving away uh, this year. That is going to be uh, very exciting. First uh, FFPC millionaire will be awarded this year. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, it will do it for our show. Your weekend of madness officially starts now. <laughs>this has been another episode of the high stakes fantasy football hour presented by myffpc.com it was broadcast live and was watched around the world balky and farrell will be back next week with more analysis more interviews and more advice from guests much smarter than they are thanks for watching and we'll talk with you again next week Yeah, just as a reminder, uh, ladies and gentlemen, too, we will um, we we always do this uh, uh, for March Madness every single year. Uh, Wednesday broadcast was a special one. We actually had a guest fall through tonight, but we're still going to try to get them on uh, in future uh, drafts. And we'll be shifting our focus uh, to Dynasty Fantasy Football um, as we uh, get ready for the launch of Season 11 of the High Stakes Fantasy Football Hour coming up as well. Thanks so much, uh, everybody. Now, feel free to enjoy all the madness of March.